Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another Sunday School Review. We appreciate you taking the time out of your, uh, your schedule. Everyone has so much going on now uh, in, with family and job and school and business and so on and so forth to where it's hard to sometimes just take the time to, to get into the Word of God. And, but it's necessary. It's very important that we learn from the Word so we know what to do what not to do, what's important, what's not important. And the word of God is a, gives us a clear indication uh, and a clear uh, pathway, a clear pattern of what we should be doing right now in our lives. Every one of us, at some point in your life, you're going to come to a time of divesting or a time of uh, reprioritizing. A time to know what's really important in your life right now and, and looking toward a better place. Although what we're doing now is necessary, uh, it's, it's very important for a season, but a season is going to come where there's going to be a change in value and it's going to be an exchange for something of a high value. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk today in our lesson, that for those that, if you have a book, uh, we use the International King James Commentary, and the subject today is finding and gathering, finding and gathering, it's Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 through 52, and we're going to, before I get into uh, reading the whole context of the scripture text of our lesson, I want to kind of give a little con context on the lesson that we're going to go over today. The parable of Jesus came to us, all these parables, in various forms. Some are developed stories. In these, we can identify several that have a beginning. The beginning kind of sets, sets the scene. Then it has a middle that involves a crisis, and it has an ending where the crisis is resolved. And this is the case in our previous lessons that we've had uh, for this whole month in the book of Matthews. But today's lesson, the parable of the treasure in the field, has, in the King James Version at least, 189 characters. The parable of the, per the pearl of great price has 142 characters. And the parable of the net has 175 characters, not including the interpretation. And the parable of the treasure of old and new has 173 characters. These are the lengths that would have allowed Matthew to tweet, to tweet them out in a few characters if Matthew had the technology that we have today. So these parables included enough detail to make a point, while at the same time allowing the reader to use their imagination for other detail. And today's lesson includes four of these many narratives that are only found in the Gospel of Matthew. And these are descriptions of the first century life, just in a few words. And these few words make a very, very powerful, powerful point. So I want you to please grab your Bibles and, and join with us as we go through Matthew chapter 13, the le our lesson text for the day, starting at verse number 44. And I'm going to pull this up so you'll be able to see it uh, as well as I read through it on our screen here today. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when man, when a man had found it, he hid it, and for joy thereof, go it and sell it all that he had, and buy it that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, into, into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then, then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed into the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a, that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. We're talking about God's kingdom and how God's kingdom is different. And the question is, since God's kingdom is different, are you ready is the question. Are we ready? Because there was a, there was a you know, you heard uh, years ago we played hide and seek. And, and the one that was, that was counting down, say like, ready or not, here I come. Well, ready or not, he's coming. And it's important for all of us to be ready for the kingdom of God because it's coming. And in many respects, it's already here. And we just got to open our eyes and see all around us the change that, uh, that we're being inspired to embrace, that the, the way we should look at things a little bit different. So let me just get into the lesson because there's a whole lot that um, we need to try to cover today. But in verse 44, we're going to do a little, again, a little outlining, which we see that the kingdom of heaven is like, is like unto a treasure that was hid in a field. That this guy went to the field and found, really not looking for, but he found this treasure. When he found it, he, he hid it again, and because he was so full of so much joy because he had appraised himself the value of this tre the treasure, and the value was worth him selling everything that he had and to try and buy this field that didn't belong to him at this moment. And at this time, Jewish law outlined that if treasure was lifted from the ground, that that treasure that was lifted from the ground belonged uh, to the current landowner, the current folks that own that field. So in order for nothing to be shady and illegal and underhanded about what this guy had found, <clears throat> the logical thing in, in, in his mind was to just buy the field. To hide, number one, let's hide this treasure again, and let's probably let's hide it in a better place than it was hid uh, when I found it. And so now if this guy was didn't have any principles, no kind of value system, dishonest, he would have just stole that tre treasure and just left and knew that he had very little chance of being caught. But you know, somebody is always watching. When you least expect it, when you don't, when you ain't looking, somebody always watching, somebody's always listening. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to just give y'all an example of a story, but I better not do it right now. And so, so since this man could, this man right here just couldn't have, didn't have the kind of money, just going out, go down to the bank and just get the money. This man decided and came to a conclusion that every, that every, this what I found in this field right here. Is, is worth more than anything that I already have. And I don't have the resources. I don't have the, 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 the FICO score. Let me use that in, in today's term. I don't have the, the, the ability to go out there and, and, and borrow that kind of money. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sell everything I got and take what I, get, what, I, what I make from this sale and go over here and buy this field. So when I buy this field now, everything on that field is going to belong to me as the new land owner. He did a quick appraisal of all that he had in his life and concluded that all that this field has to offer me is a whole lot worth, worth a whole lot more than what I have. But he was taking, this guy was taking some risk, wasn't he? Number one, uh, he had calculated the treasure that he found on this land to be worth more than everything that he had in his, had gathered, had accumulated in his entire life. That's number one. Number two was the risk that when he bought the land, 
that the treasure was going to still be there. Suppose somebody else that didn't have any principle and <laughs> didn't have any value, suppose they found the treasure and just, just left. Now he is with just some land that ain't, ain't worth pretty much probably nothing. Okay, worth nothing. Certainly not worth all that he had had in his whole lifetime. That was a risk that this guy was willing to take. But the point of this parable is that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is of unimaginable, indeterminable, unappraisable uh, value worth, worth way more than anything that we could ever have. And that in the kingdom of heaven requires something. It required a level of commitment of everything that this guy had, everything that we have to be a part of the kingdom. So the, so, so the disciples then, during this teaching here, could relate to this. Because the disciples had given up everything to follow Jesus. The disciples had given up their businesses. They had given up their livelihoods. They, 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 and, and then ultimately, in the end, they gave up their life. They did all this to follow Jesus. But then at the end of the, the day, at the end of that season, the end of their life, uh, the rewards of the kingdom was worth a whole lot more than what they had given up, their businesses and uh, the, the, some of their, a lot of their friendships. The rewards of the kingdom was worth a whole lot more than what they had given up. We see in verse 45 that the kingdom of heaven also is like a merchant man that, uh, that's out there looking for pearls. And I did some research on, on pearls and how, 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 you, how they develop, how you find them. It's amazing. You have to go to YouTube and just go, let's look at, look at how pearls are, are developed. A pearl is formed when a foreign uh, object like a like a a shell, a fragment of a shell, is trapped inside that oyster's shell. Just trapped inside, and then that oyster oyster produces a substance that they call mother of pearl, and it makes that sharp fragment, that object that got trapped inside, real smooth and real non-irritating. And some hist historians claim that pearls were seen of the highest value. And back in the Bible days, uh, even above gold, above silver, above precious gemstones, pearls was, was a pretty big deal. And we also read about pearls and the value of pearls. We see that pearls are also in the heavenly city. You heard about those 12 gates, uh, those gates of pearl in, in heaven, in the heavenly city. Uh, in the New Jerusalem. I want you to read about this in, Re in Revelation 21 and 21. The merchant man then saw, he was looking for something. He was looking for what was the word says, goodly pearls. These are pearls of the finest value because pearls carry a different kind. You got black pearls, you got purple pearls, you got uh, gold pearls, and you got these beautiful ivory pearls. And depending on the kind and size, they have a, diff a different kind of value. So this guy wasn't just looking for any pearl, but the finest pearl. And it's probably safe to assume that this guy, in talking about the, the goodly pearls, was an expert in what he did for a living. And this guy could quickly and accurately appraise the value of that pearl and what it could be, what it could possibly, possibly, possibly be sold for. Now, back at that time, under the Mosaic law, you could not eat them thing. I mean, the Jews could not eat because those things were considered unclean. But they could, they could keep the pearls that those things produce. I want you to read uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 9 through, 9 through 12. In verse 46, we're talking about the same guy that when he, when he found not a bunch of pearls, not a whole handful of black pearls or purple pearls or gold pearls or just that one beautiful ivory, round, smooth pearl. When he found one pearl of great value, he did the same thing the last guy did that found that land, that, that, that uh, treasure on that land. This guy sold everything that he had and bought this one pearl. So the man, then, almost like, it's like an obsession. 
the man became obsessed as his experienced eye, the eye of an expert, when he sold this one pearl of great price. It was a pearl unlike anything his trained eye had ever seen. It, it was highly a highly valued pearl, probably because of this perfect roundness, that perfection of the roundness of the pearl, and for likely because of the unusual brilliant shine uh, of this pearl and the brilliant color of this pearl and the large size of this pearl. He said, I ain't got nothing. I ain't got nothing. All the stuff that I, I had, my, my, my business savvy is telling me, you better go get this one. All the stuff you got right now, the, the land you got, the, the, the current jewels, jewelry that you have right now, the gems you have already purchased and or achieved or found over the years, ain't worth this one pearl right here. I want you to sell your camels. I'm going to sell my camel. I'm going to sell everything I got. Uh, I'm going to sell my sandals probably and my bags that I have. And at most, I'm going to go back home and sell. I'm going to liquidate all my properties. And I'm going to go and get this. I'm going to get this pearl. But see, the, the, the same point here is clear. The same point is very clear. To get into the kingdom of heaven requires letting go of the control of everything. Let me say that again. Letting go of the control of everything. Now, now, stay with me now. Don't, don't y'all just leave thinking I gotta go sell everything, sell your house, sell your car. Stay, just keep keep listening to the Sunday school lesson. Let's kind of bring out letting go control of everything. Now, materially, your house, your car, your land, your job, your business, your bank accounts, your your retirement accounts, everything belongs to the Lord. So now, now think about this. Now, this, this involves a shift in our thinking, a, a paradigm shift, a new set of lenses, a new way of interpreting things, which simply means the mindset is, I don't own it, I'm a steward of it. I don't own it, I'm just a manager. I don't own it, I just work on this property. I'm a steward. He allowed me to be the CEO. He allowed me to be the CFO. He allowed me to be the chief operating officer. But he's the owner of everything that, that we have, everything that we're going to get. He is the owner. Ain't that something? And so, so, so again, so, that, so that's, a, that's a different mindset. And the treasure that we're going to receive is well worth it. When Jesus becomes the pilot and you just, the co-pilot, you see what I mean? When Jesus is in control, when we relinquish control, submit and turn it all over to him, and you say, Ricky, that's easier said than done. I know it is, which means that we all got to work on ourselves a whole lot better, a whole lot more. In verse 47 and 48, we see that the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net. The kingdom is likened to a net cast into the sea and when that net is filled and full, they, they, they draw that net to the shore. Then they sat down and they gather all the good fish and all the bad fish, they throw that fish away. This is another parable now, look at this. So, so the people now that was there, the audience that was there, hearing Jesus teach, was very familiar with this, this fishing story. You see, cause you know, these, these guys was used to fishing in this very large and uh, productive and it's fresh water sea of Galilee. So they were, so this wasn't a, this wasn't a foreign story for, to them. This is what many of them did for a living, but commercial fishing was done with this large drag net. You read about this in Matthews four and 18 and the nets would have, would have floats and weights that were strong enough and suitable enough for dragging the nets between two boats. One boat over here, one boat over here, and they, just, and they just drag the net. And that net just encompasses and caught all kind of stuff in the net, all kind of fish uh, that was in the width of that net. And, and this kind of what the commentary calls indiscriminate fishing did not separate the, the fish that swam on the top from the fish that swam on the bottom 
It didn't separate all the debris and maybe cans or whatever they had back at that time that also got caught in the net. It didn't separate all the eels and catfish and and all the whatever kind of sea animal they had at that time didn't stop them from getting caught in the net. It was like, we don't know, it's not known how many different species of fish was there at that time, but then some say there was 24 different kinds of fish at that time in the Sea of Galilee. But the law of Moses had some stipulations. The law, the, law, the, the law of Moses said that fish that had fins and scales were the only kind that the people of God could even, that was considered clean, that they could even eat. So stuff like eels and all kind of catfish, which would kind of mess us up back, you know, back now. Much, much we like to eat that catfish, that old hot catfish, you know, with a little hot sauce on it, coleslaw, and uh, you know, it's just it's a wonderful thing. But back at that time, no, no, you can't eat no catfish. This stuff ain't got no, it's smooth and ain't got no scales on it. You can't eat no shellfish. You can't eat no oysters and open it up and you know, put that hot sauce. You can't eat none of them, them oysters back there then. You can't eat it. So that's got to have no kind of personal or commercial value back that in. And so they had to they had to go through a separation process. Well, look how Jesus is using these parables. Now he's gonna to come to a, a pinnacle here in a minute. In verse 49 and 50, it, look what he said. Now he's coming to he's gonna bring it to a close. Now so shall it be at the end of the world. He told them, just Jesus talking out there, it's gonna be like this at the end of the world. The angels gonna come. And what they're going to do, they're going to they gonna cut, they're going to sever the wicked. And then they're going to cast them where wicked in a furnace of fire. And what's going to happen? It's going to be, it's going to be welling and hollering and going on and gnashing of teeth. You know, just, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be grinding of teeth, just grinding the teeth. Lord, let me out of here. But it's going to be, it's going to be too late then. So fishermen, fishermen in this parable here was almost like, like farmers, because they were going to be harvesting, harvesting the fish from that lake. And they're going to be throwing out the, the bad fish, like, they, like, like in the other, other parable, getting rid of the weed. And they're going to be keeping the good fish, like in a previous parable, keeping the wheat. So, so, so in the end, in the end, at the end of the day, it ain't about fishes. It ain't about fish. It ain't about nets. It's an allegory. And then it's about the harvest. What's the harvest? The end of the world. What's the harvest? The end of the world and, and the time of final judgment. So then the point of the parable is about the eternal. The, the point of this parable is about destination. But not, not just a, a, a temporary destination. It's about an eternal destination. The wicked is going to be incarcerated. Not incarcerated in a prison cell. Uh, not so people can come and visit and see how you're doing today and bring you something. Not that kind of incarceration. It's going to be incarceration in a fiery furnace that never that's never quenched, that has no end. It's going to be incarceration in a fiery furnace, a furnace that has eternal punishment. Look at this. Look at this parable. And so, 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 so. They're going to want to have relief, but can't get no relief. As a matter of fact, let me read Revelation 21. We got a little bit more time. 21, 21, and um, Revelation 21 and verse 8. Here's what it says. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murders and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake, lake, L-A-K-E, which burn it with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. And there are those that don't believe that there's a place called hell. There are those that don't believe there's a place called heaven. Let me say this to you. Suppose you're wrong. Now, we know it is because we're Christians and we believe, we believe the word of God. But suppose you're wrong. How, uh, wouldn't it be worth it to, if you're going to err, to err on the side of caution? And, and what do you have to lose? Okay, I got to live a clean life. Uh, I'm going to live according to the word of God. 
that's going to help me mentally, spiritually, physically. It's going to help me to, to make sure the temple is clean. It, it just tells me to treat my fellow man right. It tells me to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, soul, and mind. To treat my neighbor as I treat myself. To not lie, cheat, and steal. Okay. The alternative is to do all those things. To do things that are kind of, and, to, and to deny the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the alternative. Not to believe in a higher being, the Lord God Almighty, the one and true Savior. It is to relinquish your pride for something a whole lot higher and a whole lot better. What you got to lose? You, nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Ain't that something, y'all? In verse 51, Jesus, Jesus is still talking. He's, he said, look, y'all understand what I just told y'all? Do y'all understand the, all these things? Have you understood all these things? Look at what they said. Yay, Lord. You see, sometimes, anyway, let me just kind of give you a little, little commentary here. These parables combine to provide some critical insight. Critical, critical insight into the nature of the kingdom of heaven. First, it's going to cost them all that they have to be a part of this kingdom. Rel rel relinquish your control. Number two, the reward to being a part of this, this kingdom of God is going to be greater than anything you could have ever given up. And in many cases, let me say this again, is giving up your control, your pride, your ego, Ricky, your ego, John, your ego, Mary, whoever the John and Marys are, the Rickies are in this audience. It includes me, you, and everybody that we know. Number two, the reward of being a part of the kingdom of heaven is a whole lot greater than anything that we relinquish or give up. And then the third thing we see is a warning. Okay, a warning if you don't do it. So we see three what ifs in this lesson. What if the what if the man had not given up everything to claim the treasure in that field? What if the merchant man had not given up and sold everything to buy this pearl of great value, great price? And what if what if their possessions in their mind was a whole lot more important than than following Jesus? They would have made a grave mistake. If so, they would have they would have lost the greatest reward. What's the greatest? What's the greatest reward, Ricky? Being counted as part of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus then went on to push them. He pushed them by asking them a question: Have you understood all these things? Which implied a, a much deeper question: Are y'all ready to give up everything? To follow me? That's the real question. And then he, he, here's how they responded. Yea, Lord. And the commentary calls that bravado. It's, it's like a, they reveal bravado, which is this pretended bravery. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, I know. You don't know. He, he, they, I understand. I got it. See? Pride. It come right before the struggle. It come right before the fall. Why I got this. You see, if we don't understand something, it's all right to say, I don't know. I don't understand. Give me more information. Give me some more revelation. Help me to understand it better. I got it. I, I want to read Matthews 26 and 35 as I bring this to a close. Matthews 26, 35 says, Peter said unto him, this is what Peter can say now. Though I should, though I should die with thee, Yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. And y'all know what Peter eventually did, right? Of course, he came back into the came back around. But Peter did deny him. Not one time, not two times, three times. You know, so let, let, let's watch out for this thing called pride. In the last verse, then he said to them, every kind which is in every stride, which is instructed into the kingdom of heaven, is like a man that is a householder, which bringing out his treasures, his treasured new things and old things. A scribe was a literate person who took all of the pain of, of copying the word of God by hand. 
They had no copy machines back then in. And it had to be done just right. He was an expert in the, in the Mosaic law. You read about this in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6. And this verse here, the new and the old, in this context, refer to the new treasure of Jesus and the old treasure of the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. But Jesus found it also very necessary to scrutinize, criticize, and condemn, not all of them, but many of these scribes and their counterpart, the Pharisees, because they failed, they failed to, recognize, to recognize the word of God in this regard. But then there were some of the scribes that, that was willing to find this new treasure, of the, the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom of heaven, seeing it as an extension to their old treasures of Jewish scriptures and willing to make the change. And the question is, are you willing, and we out of time now, are you willing to make, are we willing to make the change? Are we willing to relinquish control? Give up everything to follow him. There's a song that talks about that. I gave up everything to follow him. This world is not our home class. It's, we're just pilgrims, pilgrims passing through. There's a bigger place. There's a better place. And so don't get too attached to things and stuff. Because you sure ain't going to take none of this stuff with you. You understand that, right? None of this stuff going with you. So let's make sure we keep our focus on heaven. And say, Lord, all this belongs, everything that I am and am to be belongs to you. Hey, look, y'all have a great week. We'll see you next time on our next Sunday School Review. Take care.